you hire somebody as soon as you can so that you could get in and work on your business. You know that saying, work work on your business, not in your business. Um, I could not agree with that more. I wish I would have done that sooner. Part of it sometimes I think is greed um, and maybe not, that might be the wrong word, but I, it is, it's like not willing to give up. But if I had to do anything differently, I would have um, certainly hired sooner. Welcome to the Cleaning Up Podcast, Millionaire Secrets of the Home Services Industry, brought to you by me, Ron Holt, CEO and founder of Two Maids and a Mop, America's fastest growing cleaning company. I get a chance to sit down with home service industry pros and other entrepreneurial leaders so they can share their stories, their insight, their experiences. It's so much fun. You're going to learn so much. And you're going to be inspired to take your small business into a national brand just like I did. All right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Cleaning Up Podcast, Millionaire Secrets of the Home Services Industry. Of course, I'm Ron, CEO and founder of Two Maids at a Mop and proud host of of this show. And today we have Joseph Sheehan. Joseph is the owner of a pest control company, but not just any pest control company, the pest control company in the New York City area. It's called Colony Pest Management, and he started it more than 18 years ago after being in the industry for a long time, following in the footsteps of his father, Ed. Joseph and Ed today not only operate this pest control business and just kick tail, but they also have a really, really cool podcast, which which is how I sort of stumbled into these guys that talks about everything from the logistics within the pest control industry to home services in general, which is what we are excited to learn about today. So, Joseph, welcome to the Cleaning Up Podcast. Thank you, Ron. It's a pleasure to be on. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. So as you can tell by Joseph's accent, he is from Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, no, oh, and serious, obviously, he's, he's a Brooklyn kid. And so I'm, I'm really interested to hear your story, Joseph, because I know that your, your father, Ed, built his own very successful multi-million dollar pest control business. And uh, most kids even though they love and admire their fathers typically want to do the opposite of what their dad did, you know? And so tell me what kept you inside the industry and we'll kind of get into some of the business after that. So uh, it's actually uh, a long story. I'll keep it as short as I can. So my whole life I was, and every teacher that said, you really need to know this, I would say, yeah, but I'm taking over my father's business. So not so much. Right all through high school, I passed and I had decent grades, but I always knew that was what I was gonna do. So obviously working the business in the summers and whatnot, learning everything, graduate high school. And my father's very old school. So, you know, high school graduation, you think it's supposed to be a happy moment. And, uh, and it was, but um, I swear, right as I'm walking out the door, of the graduation ceremony. He says, oh, congratulations, this is awesome. Uh, Rent is due on Friday. (laughs) And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, well, now you're gonna work and you gotta pay rent and that's that. So that just gives you a little insight into him. So I worked for him probably for about four months and I I hated it. Um, He treated me harsh, harshly. He he treated me without explanations. He made me work from the bottom up I was working six days a week, probably 60 hours a week, working nights. Um, and I just didn't like it. So I went back to my high school, uh, got some help from one of my teachers, ended up in college um, in 1998, a year before I was about to graduate. He got an offer from one of the big boys to sell. And he called me and he was like, listen, I know you hate this, but you think you're going to graduate and come back and do this? Cause I'll hold off. And, you know, we had a great conversation and it was a life could have been, it was a life changing experience from him. He never had to work again at the age of 55. So I was like that, just take it. I'll make my way in the world. Don't worry about it. And uh, so he sold, I get out of college. I get uh, a, my college job making $32,000 a year. And uh, I was also counting money on the side for a guy that was selling um, cigarettes and, he got paid a lot in cash, so he had a money room, he put me in a money room. So I was still hustling. And uh, his his very close friend, when West Nile hit, which is we now uh, was at that time, they thought it was Eastern equine encephalitis, 
he was servicing both Aqueduct and Belmont racetracks in New York City, and they were scared for the horses. So he needed someone two nights a week um, to treat the bonds. And he asked me if I wanted to do it, and I did it. Uh, and it was paying me basically for two nights a week, about three hours a night, the same as my nine to five job. So he made me an offer. I worked for him for maybe two years. Yeah, because I was 01. Oh, yeah, maybe two years. And uh, I grew his business by close to $200,000. But when I hit about 100, I approached him and said, look, I'm not going to keep doing this without a piece. He gave me a, he gave me a piece of whatever I brought in after that, which I thought was fair. And um, when I got a big account, he took, he never he didn't give me the money for it. And it big, it was like $2,500 a month, which is nice. Um, and he told me because his friend, he, he not his friend, uh, another account that he had, that was their cousins. So I really shouldn't get it. And we argued about it because I said, look, they called my cell phone. I sold it. And then I asked him a key question. I said, how long did you have the other account? He was like 25 years. I said, right. So from 25 years, they just called you now because of you service. And I said, look, if you give, and at that point I was working for him six days a week. Um, I was working nights, you know, because I put all that business on. And uh, so he told me, he said, no, when I sell you the business, you, I won't charge you for that. I said, okay, you sell me the business this year. He said, no, when I'm ready. I said, well, I feel like I'm going to lose 50% of this profit until you sell. And that's not fair. We argued back and forth and he was firm. And I said, okay, good. I am no longer working six days a week. I'm no longer working nights. I'm going back to my original schedule. And good luck. And, you know, from that point on, we knew what was happening. I went and bought a small pest control company, Colony Pest. Um, it was Colony Pest Control. I changed it to management um, and incorporated. And I worked it while working for him probably for about four months until I built it up to what I thought was sustainable for my life. And then I gave him my notice. And I gave him a month's notice and he was even mad at that. Um, and then six months later, he couldn't handle all the work I put on. So he sold me that, which was a nice shot in the arm. And I bought it for 60 cents on the dollar. So that was like, that was my groove. That was 2003, 2004. And then we just started going from there. I started heavy commercial. Um, we're still heavy commercial, but we, we're, the plan is to even it out to probably 60, 40 within the next two years. Uh, more per 60 percent um, commercial and 40 percent residential. Um, obviously, my father has been my mentor, um, helping me navigate normal pitfalls of a pest control business. But it was very funny because the pest control piece I had since I was raised in it, but I didn't have any real business acumen at all. And I remember asking him about accounting stuff. And he was kind of like, I've been, I've been out of the game for four years. And even, even back in 1998, well, more than four years, it was probably like six. In 1998, he was like, I had people doing this. He was like, so I was at a whole higher level of checking numbers and whatnot. So I immediately <laughs> enrolled in a QuickBooks and accounting class um, just so that I knew, you know, I didn't take, I, I was a psychology major because I, I didn't want to do business for the whole experience with my dad. So I immediately enrolled in that accounting class, learned QuickBooks, learned accounting 101. Um, and just to, you know, went running from there. Well, things have worked out pretty well for you to say the least. You're, you're, you're the go-to pest control company in pretty much all of the New York city tri-state area, multi-million dollar revenue business. Uh, 18 plus years in existence. That's those are things that a lot of people that are listening to this show dream about. You know, building them, their business into. So congratulations on all the success. Uh, let's kind of go back to those early days real quickly. Uh, we'll, we'll get to the good stuff here in just a minute. Uh, but a lot of people who start a home service business, whether it's a two maids in a mop franchise or or a pest control business that's independent, uh, most people think that the thing they have to do to get really started is get their hands dirty. And obviously that's important. I don't think anyone should own a business there that, that they don't understand, you know, they need to know how to do the trade. Uh, how important is that? And when, if you're going to get your hands dirty, when is it time to stop being a technician and start being an owner? Well, I think a lot of that has to do with business acumen. Um, but I think, 
depending on your lifestyle, you have to have a plan, right? Um, and I didn't when I first started, but I would say once you get it to a sustainable level where you can survive, if you don't have capital, if you're truly starting from scratch, then you hire somebody as soon as you can so that you could get in and work on your business. You know that saying, work work on your business, not in your business. Um, I could not agree with that more. I wish I would have done that sooner. Part of it sometimes I think is greed um, and maybe not, that might be the wrong word, but I, it is, it's I'm not willing to give up. But if I had to do anything differently, I would have um, certainly hired sooner. I would have looked at, so I was raised not to borrow money, which quickly changed as I got in business and the new way of the world. So I probably would have went to a small bank or, I mean, my father had friends that uh, were hard money lenders. I mean, I would have probably figured out a way to go borrow money, a couple hundred thousand dollars and just dump it all in uh, to marketing and growth and everything just to grow quicker. So what, what does life look like today for you? Early on, I'm assuming you were a technician. You, you, you did the work, but, but I, yes. 18 years later, what's life like for you today? Um, it doesn't suck. Um, <laughs> it, uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's more high level, which honestly is uh, a lot harder than the technical work. You, we talk about it on our podcast all the time that killing bugs and killing pests is the easiest part of it. So now my, my day to day is high level meetings, crunching numbers, going over budgets, you know, um, meeting with my staff. I, I meet with, my director of operations every Tuesday after he has his Monday meeting with, with his management team, he and I run the numbers, what the AR reports are like, what AP is looking like, what trouble, what, what trouble is going on, you know, just giving me an update every Tuesday. Um, once a month, I meet with the accountants, they crunch all the numbers, they give us all the net profit, gross profit, where we could be hemorrhaging, what's going on. It's really a lot of it is about numbers. Um, and getting, you know, double check. The director of operations really is doing a lot of the processes and, and tweaking them, but I am still overseeing most of the financial processes. So a lot of that, just a lot of high level stuff. And then obviously trying to branch out and do different things. Um, I'm great that we had this connection because part of the podcast is potential franchising down the road. Uh, I'm, uh, we branched into the DC, Maryland, Virginia area with a canine scent detection team. Um, and pre-COVID, that was, that was looking to be a monster. Uh, COVID beat that up a little bit. But the plan was to have that as almost like a test franchise or branch. And we still don't know if we're going to do a franchise or just branch across the country. Um, but that that is... Uh, part of what we're going to do. So I, I, we, we will certainly keep in touch and depend on Absolutely. which route you go. Look, I, I, I'm, picking I, your brain. I'm a big fan of franchising. It's, it's got its pros and cons, no doubt about it, but there's a, a lot of pros that I'd, I'd love to share with you down the road. Um, so most people listening to this, let's just be honest. If you're a multi-million dollar home service business, you probably are, you know, your feet are up. You, you may, you've got your, uh, your beach trip planned, you know, for the summer already. Things are, things are good, but a lot of people who are listening to this are not multi-million dollar service business owners. They're struggling. They're either a startup or they are a perpetual startup, which means they can't get out of startup mode. They're always just trying to figure out how to get over that hump. Everyone goes through struggles. I, I, I'm assuming Steve Jobs even had his, his day in the, you know, where he didn't know what he was, if he was going to make it. Um, Bill Gates, all these big guys that we always think about who from the outside looking in looks like everything was perfect. But I believe every business owner, every entrepreneur goes through some struggles, whether they're life struggles or business struggles. What type of struggles did you experience? How did you overcome those? What can we learn from that if, if we're in a similar place today in our, inside our own business? Oh, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the biggest struggles was getting out of my father's shadow in the industry um, and even his shadow in my own business because... Obviously, he did it all. And I would say from 2003 to 2008, uh, 
his word was gold or things that he said, you know, it was, it, there were fights if I disagreed, which it, it is what it is. But um, so that was very difficult, even for him to acknowledge. And we had this moment in 2008 when I said, because anything I was going to do new, I would run by him first. And I said, Dad, I'm going to buy this bed bug dog sniffs out bad bugs i explained the whole thing to him he was like ah i saw that in the 80s with termite dogs people lost their shirts and i was like yeah but this isn't termites it's different um and my sister was working in office at the time we had what some people would think like a knockout drag down fight but that's kind of how we talk to each other a lot of foul language um and we didn't agree and we walked away from that meeting um and went and had dinner as father and son, which is a very unique thing. I have no idea how he and I were able to make that happen, but we could have a business fight and then walk outside the office door and be like, ah, oh, see you later, we'll have dinner, whatever. But um, whatever the cost of that dog was, say 30 or 40,000 between the cost of the dog, the, the upstart marketing, all the travel and, and the training, I made that back in the first two months. And probably less. And I showed it to him and I showed him the numbers after six months. And it was, it, it clicked for him that now I was in the role. You know what I mean? Like that he, that, okay, look, I'm not the top dog or whatever word you would use, but it was a great moment because I'll never forget it. After that, people would ask him questions and he would say, look, you got to ask Joey. And I, the first time he said it, I was like, did I really just hear that? Because that had never happened. So that was probably the hardest thing. And then other typical things that are more business related, you know, like I told you, I didn't know anything about accounting. Um, and I remember having lunch very early on when I started my business with my uncle, who's super successful, uh, runs a global company sale division. And he just said to me, he said, listen, the number one reason business fails in the first five years is because of poor accounting. And literally after that conversation and my father telling me that he hadn't really been involved in it, that's when I immediately went out and took that class. So I think you got to have a plan. Um, so that was not having a plan day one and then having to put the plan together once I realized you needed a plan. Uh, that was probably, again, one of the biggest struggles. Got it. All right. So one of the things I'm excited to learn about you and your business is relationships. We, we talk about customer experience on this show. Well, probably every single episode, <laughs> all the way back to the very first one, I believe customer experience, AKA also known as relationships with your customers is more important than really anything you do. Obviously the trade is what gets you in the door. What keeps you in that door is the relationship that you build as you're servicing the customer. And I know you're dealing with a lot of commercial accounts, but inside those commercial office walls, there are people, you know, so we, we tend to think that commercial versus residential are two different things. And I'm, I'm sure that technically they are two different things, but from a relationship standpoint, I, I feel like they're probably very similar. So um, I have heard that you, you devote more energy and even investment towards relationship building than marketing uh, you know, of your services and business. Talk to us about how important that is for you and what the evolution has looked like from the early days to where we are today. Well, I, I'm a huge believer in networking and building relationships. Um, even it's very funny because my sister recently came back into the business and she was amazed at some of the residential clients that have been there for 18 years. And I think um, coming full circle, we just... Um, creating those relationships. We just had somebody call us uh, that I've known for probably 15 years. They, they switched. We hadn't been in touch for three years, four years. The second his, his building had mice, he didn't hesitate. He called me and this is a potential six, the whole portfolio is, you know, high six figures, potential in pest control. So just keeping those, keeping in touch with them, even if it's a stupid note or text message or just, obviously creating your mail mailing list and never letting that go, taking every opportunity you can to go out and network in a group, uh, staying in that group, um, doing anything you can. You think about it. You could spend a thousand dollars 
on Google marketing, which is not a bad investment if, if you can do it right. Or you can go to this networking thing that costs you $50 a month. And then they ask you to sponsor a scholarship fund or a golf outing, and which is marketing dollars just in a different way. And you do that and you get in FaceTime, you're talking to people, they're getting to know you, you know your business. And I mean, I had, I went to a place and I was talking to a guy in this networking meeting about bed bugs because he had questions. And he was like, well, I really wish my guy was as passionate about you. And the next meeting, they asked me to speak. I didn't even know who the, the guy was. And he was one of the founding members of the group. So they asked me to speak. So a lot of opportunity comes from just being out there networking and that personal touch, like however big you get, me personally, I'm never too big to take anyone's phone call. If you live in a one bedroom apartment or you own 25 buildings in Manhattan or wherever you are, I will take your phone call. Now, my team doesn't give my cell phone out, but they'll take your cell phone and I will absolutely call you back. So I, one, I, one thing that's been that was interesting to learn about you it, here in our industry, the residential cleaning industry, there there really isn't there is an association, but it's a pretty loose association. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't have a lot of staying power. It's, it's been a lot of change within it over the last twenty years. Even, I believe in the pest control industry, there are much stronger associations, not just nationally but even regionally. And so, I know you've been. I've been very present, uh, very active, in the the New York City tri-state association. How helpful has that been to you to become a thought leader within that space? Well, it, it's been super helpful with recognition um, and just giving back to, you know, I was in that position where I was at one man show, even though I had my father when I went to these meetings, I always learned from someone um, what they were doing differently, even with going into the residential market and being so actively involved. I've people from Buffalo, New York, people from the West Coast, other pest management companies, guys that I was here on this trip I'm at now with Pennsylvania, New Jersey, all doing residential. They helped me put my residential program together. They helped me uh, explain some things to me because I wasn't, I was more pure play commercial. Uh, so that's a huge help. You, somebody's going to give you exactly how they do their treatment processes in a residential home, what to look for. So being active in nationally and, and locally has really helped with that camaraderie and then like with the residential, them giving me the keys to their kingdom. So, the, and, and the other, the, the networking piece for the business that I was more talking about is more like different trades, um, you know, building associations, hotel associations, healthcare associations, uh, manager associations, stuff like that. Um, because that's, that's really where the customers are. And being in national, I, I just gave a guy in Seattle, Washington, um, a, a job because somebody that we did here moved there and asked me if I could recommend someone. So because we're friends and we have similar beliefs and how to run our businesses, um, I trust that he'll do a good job. And so there you go. That That's continuing the relationship. Someone moved across the country. Their family still all lives here. They had a great experience with me. Now they're going to have a great experience with my friend in Seattle. If anybody ever says something to them about pests, they're going to say, you got to call Kyle. That's like, you. I know, I know oftentimes a lot of people, when they think about their competitors, it, especially locally, it's sometimes competitive, you know, so you, you don't necessarily believe that there's an opportunity to build a friendship and a relationship. It sounds like you've been able to pull that off and it's, it's helped everyone, not just you. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's why I stay involved with the association. Uh, when I see the younger guys coming in and they ask questions, I don't blow them off. I take time to talk to them. Um, and any questions that they have, as long as they're not too personal or they don't, they're not too much trade secrets that we have on intellectual property. I'll share it with them because I was there and I appreciate the people that came before me that helped me. And if you, if you don't give back after be given to being given to, uh, calm is going to come by and back you, but come back and bite you. Absolutely. You couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. All right. So let's talk about the thing that everybody wants to talk about. They've been waiting for this one. Employees. 
it, it's it's super easy, right? Like you you've never had any problems. You people knock on your door begging to work for you, and then they just retire there. They never quit. Uh, is that how it works? One hundred percent every time. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's yeah. the toughest thing in, in the business, in any business, but certainly in home services and the service industry in general. Yeah, so here in our industry, the, the cleaning industry, turnover is, is rampant. You know, it's just, it's been that way for a very long time. Coronavirus has not helped the situation. The economic impact, at least from it, hasn't helped. It, it's a tough, it's a tough deal. So we work hard here trying to figure out ways that we can better hire, you know, hire better people. But on top of that, what we can do to, to keep them hired as well, that's, that's probably is more important than even the hiring part. Uh, but let's, let's start with, with step one, just getting these folks to, to show up for an interview, getting these guys to accept your job opportunity and, and then show up on their first day on, on the job. Uh, that by itself is, is work. You know, it's, it's not just a given. Maybe, I don't know, if, like you, we and I, you and I started a business almost the exact same time. I started Two Maids in a Mop on April 1st, April Fool's Day of all days in 2003. So we go back uh, similar time frames. Back in those days, I sound like grandpa, uh, but back in those days, it was a little bit easier. People needed jobs and you said, I will exchange your work for a paycheck. And there was a little a level of almost gratitude there and devotion to the work. Uh, today, it's completely different. You know, you're selling people on the job opportunity, I believe. So w- what are you doing differently today than what you did forever ago? Uh, and and what's, what's working for you in terms of hiring the right kind of people? So, uh, yeah, hiring. I just, I, you know, my head hurts thinking about it. Um, but we're doing, we're doing everything different. I, and you said it, you just said it perfectly about your, you have to sell your business to the people that you want to hire. And um, one of the things that we recognized probably about five or six years ago is that we had to revamp everything. I, we were always offering a 401k package and healthcare, but um, we weren't really selling it correctly. The company overall, what we're really doing, we had to switch up our job ads. Um, and none of it is really um, incorrect or uh, misleading. It's, it's really what we do. Uh, one, of, one of our famous job ads that we got a lot of uh, people coming uh, and sending send their resumes was it, it read, do you want to be a superhero? And it was about, it was literally about saving the environment, helping people. And uh, you would never think prior to a few years ago, you wouldn't even think to put any of that in a pest control job. You would put can, can work long days, can lift 50 pounds, all things that immediately segregate really good applicants. So we just realized we had to revamp everything. We started about six years ago. I hired a business consultant about two years ago um, and she came in and really helped us with our processes. And we have a whole um, map and, process that they they follow from job ad to hiring someone we've implemented things like the predictive index which is a behavioral um assessment that a year we got it about a year ago right before covid and it has literally changed the game uh i don't know if you heard of predictive index or not ron have you i i have heard of it i i I have never actually participated in it, uh, I, but yeah, we, we've looked at it spe- specifically on our, on our end. Franchise ownership has its own personality traits that we tend to look for. So we've used it in a limited manner on that side, but not on the, on the job side with hiring people. Yeah. So, so predictive index, obviously our business coach introduced us to it. She gave it to me and my director of operations first. It's literally a three minute assessment where you pick words. And then for me and him, it nailed us to the T. Um, And then it could do relationships. So she did us individually and then our relationship. And it's about how you communicate uh, well and how you communicate poorly and then gives you tips to communicate better. So what our our new hiring process, right? So you, you also asked a question on how do we get people in the seats? You have to have a process that people go through because when usually when they go through this rigorous process to get a job, which some people frown upon, it's not rigorous, but it's resume, uh, good, good resume, phone call. After the phone call, email that includes an application, get the application back. We review it internally. Once we say, all right, we want to interview this person, um, we send them an email. 
Uh, we'd like to have you in for an interview. What days work for you? Here's the availability for the next couple of days. They confirm. As soon as they confirm, they get emailed two reference forms um, and they get emailed the link to take the predictive index assessment. And they have to have the index um, predictive index assessment completed 24 hours before the interview. So in predictive index, you can go in and say, okay, I'm hiring for a pest control technician. You can build what behavioral, what, what somebody's full chart would look like for a perfect service technician, for a sales manager, for a, a cleaning person, whatever it is, you can build that out. And then when they fill it out, it shows you how close they are to that position and prints out interview questions geared towards their, their pros and cons or geared toward you know, how well they work. And then it, it makes specific questions towards some of the things they're uncomfortable with. Um, and implementing that has been insane. And once, once the people come on board, we go a step further. If you're in our office, we put your assessment at your desk. It's printed out. It says your name. It says what type of, they have like, I think 10 or 12 different types. It says what type you are. And then it says, I respond well to this type of communication. So you could literally read it before having any kind of conversation and change how you speak to them. And my service manager has been using it for tough conversations or when he has to go do a performance improvement with a service tech. And the first time we did it, he came back and he was like, wow, that I, I paid attention to this and it worked really well. And during COVID, which may have an asterisk because of COVID, but our turnover for 2020 was like 1%, which is, we were shooting for 15 and it was 1%, which is insane. Wow. That is insane. You know, just listening to you talk, I mean, I can even feel the passion. So I think, I think that the process is awesome as it is. Um, I, I, I've got to learn more myself because it sounds like something we can use here inside our industry for sure. But the fact that you go through so many, I wouldn't call them obstacles, but certainly different steps as a job candidate, I think that by itself, even though you're getting a lot of intel from it, that process allows you to see who's engaged, who, who's going to be, who's someone that's going to be excited about the job. That's going to give you a leg up, but on their end, the fact that you're going through these different steps proves to them this is legit. This is a real job that has a future. This is a career potentially for me. Uh, this isn't just another pest control company where they're dying to hire people tomorrow. No, 100%. And that's the number one thing. We're not really hiring. Uh, what, is, what is it? Like the whole gig culture, is it called right now? Right, we, right. We, we're hiring people that want careers want to retire, when they can retire, want to support their family. And we provide packages that make that a possibility. I mean, we even went, part of the whole hiring piece was being able to show a career path. If you come in if you, and you have no pest control experience, it's up to you how quickly you want to grow because you can take, literally take, your, your, you have to take a mandatory test. You can take your test it's a 30 hour course. It's up to you when you want to take it. Right. Um, or how I should say how fast you want to get through it. You have nine months to complete it and then get become a certified technician. And there's a clear career path. You start at this dollar amount as a, an apprentice. When you go to technician, you're at this dollar amount and, and you know it's between, let's just say, one dollar to five dollars. And then you have to add to your knowledge by getting more categories in pest control and then you could keep going up the ladder and it shows the clear path to the applicant the new hire this is what you can do now it is up to you to do it we are going to train you we're going to give you all the tools we are going to support you from you know and one of one of my biggest things i try to be if i'm not on the first interview i i definitely do the second interview and I tell them, nobody at this company is unapproachable. And that includes me. Everybody here has my cell phone. You can call me. You can text me. You can email me. If you have any problems, you should follow the chain of command for certain things. But if it's a personal matter or something else, you can always reach out to me. If it's an HR problem, you can, you can certainly make me aware of it, whatever it is. 
And um, I think a lot of them appreciate that. And part of our company culture, and we explain it to them, this is like the short version. Um, we're a corporation with a mom and pop feel, and we want to maintain that family atmosphere forever. And, uh, and once people hear all this in the interview, like we don't even get into the benefits package until the end. And it, uh, a lot of times people are excited to come work for us. And, and it's been very good. And one of the biggest things that we've been doing over the past, I would say, year and a half is paying attention to people's reaction to our culture. And even after we hire them, making sure that they are the right fit in our culture. And if they're not, unfortunately, it's a, it's a, bad, it's a red flag. Yeah, I could see why someone would want to be excited about this opportunity. You're excited about it. So uh, more, I see this all the time in the services industry, the, the, the just pure dread of hiring, you know, because you've, you've done this so many times. You've hired, you've fired, you've interviewed, you've set up interviews that didn't show up. All these negative things happen. And as the hiring manager, sometimes the owner of the business is that hiring manager, all of those past failures, all those past negative experiences come off and, and everything from your body language to your tone to sometimes even your words. Uh, for instance, I've, I've heard people say, hey, you're, you're hired and you're going to show up, right? And all these things that have make people think, well, of course I was going to show up. Why should I not show up? Uh, and so just the fact that there's a process, just you know, the, the excitement level, the energy you have for it, all that's going to transfer to that job candidate. And they are going to also have that same level of excitement. And I'm sure that in the 18 years that you've, you've poured everything into a job candidate and failed, you know, so it's not like you've just had nothing but roses, you know, you, you've, you've had your fair share of negative experiences as well. So I'm impressed. I really am impressed that you can still have this level of passion for it because I talk to a lot of people in this industry, this consumer services industry, and it's tough sometimes. It's tough to keep that level of passion high. It is, and, and it, this did not happen overnight. <laughs> I just realized that the negativity breeds negativity. And, and uh, that's not, I'm not always like this, Ron, by the way. Like I, I do my best. I, we all have our down moments, but I just realized like we, you, if you're negative, everyone's going to feel it. You have to stay positive. One of, so our mantra for 2021, we, we do a strategic initiative meeting with all management. Um, every, we did it January this year, next year, we're hoping to do it in November or early December. And we go over, each department goes over what they want to change for the year. Um, I steer the conversation a little bit. Then we put a whole strategic initiative together. But the biggest, so my thing, like I, I start the meeting off and all you saw on the screen was, yes, we can. And I was like, we can't, I want everybody in this meeting to approach every crazy idea that comes out of my head and everybody else's head in here right now. I don't want any negative comments. I just want you to say, yes, we can. And I want us to all give it a try. As long as it's been, you, if you can't necessarily see the benefit to the business, let's, let's talk it out a little bit further, but no negativity. The mantra is yes, we can. And what's so good about that is we're starting all our meetings with that. My director of operations, I see it on his meeting agenda. He starts with yes, we can. And, and that, they're going to get that in their head. It may take until June for it to really trickle down to everybody. But once you start with that, it's that whole um, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you start negative, you're going to be negative because you have a negative mindset. If you start positive, it's going to be positive. Now, you may not crush it. You may not hit your goal 100%, but I guarantee you that it's going to be better than when you started out because you went into it positively. So, I've just, that's really been my biggest thing. And it's funny because like I told you, my sister came back in to the business. She's been gone probably almost eight or nine years. And um, I made her an offer she couldn't refuse, by the way, Ron. <laughs> and uh, she spent, she lives in North Carolina right now. And she was, she couldn't, she spent six weeks, almost seven in our Brooklyn office uh, retraining, right? Again, just seeing all the new and she was like, how the hell did this happen to you? 
she was just, she was like you, you're less micromanaging which i'm a huge believer in stop micromanaging if you own a business just get these processes in place that are very easy um to alleviate that people can look at a piece of paper and do almost any task in your business that'll take away from the micromanaging and allow you as an owner manager or whatever to just be more efficient um, and she was like, how did you do this? And I, I just told her a lot of practice and a lot of heartache because as an owner, when you start to let go of the things you do every day and that person doesn't do it exactly how you do it, it's tough. But after a while, if you hire right and you treat them right, you notice, okay, maybe he doesn't do it exactly how I do it, but he's getting the job done. The team loves him or her and Nothing's really changed except for you're not really have this headache anymore and your business is growing and you're able to work on higher level things to continue doing this. So it's, it's been a, it's been a long 18 years, Ron, but it's, it's, it's been a great journey and I, I would change some things, but I wouldn't change the journey. Well, it, it has been a, it has been a journey for all of us that have built businesses from the ground up and uh, you know, we're probably, I'm sure there's somebody out there that goes, wow, you guys have just had it so easy, but you and I both know it's nothing's easy. And there's as hard as those early days are the, the latter years aren't that easy either, you know? So success also creates more problems. So it, it's, it's, it's been a good ride for both of us though. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. All right. No. So I had some real kind of off the cuff questions for you. If you're ready for these, these are kind of impromptu and hopefully, sure. hopefully I don't stump you, uh, but I, I, they're always fun for me and also for our audience as well. So let's start with the first one. I'm a super nerd when it comes to anything, business, entrepreneurship, whatever, you know? And so I always like to ask this question. Uh, I already know the answer to, to part two of this, but what's one book and one podcast that you would listen to that specifically relates to what we do here in the services industry, the trades? So um, we spoke a lot about culture and one of the, one of the books that I've read twice and just uh, recently purchased it as an audio book so I could play it while sleeping so that I get it again and again and again was Culture Code by um, Daniel Coyle. Uh, and it really helped. And, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that all of the things that I was talking about and what we're doing with hiring, I didn't come up with all of this out of thin air. Uh, I got it from a lot of really smart people uh, and a lot of things in the industry that are put out there to help. And I've just built upon them. So um, I'm a big believer in learning from others. But Culture Code by Daniel Coyle um, is a phenomenal book. And I'm going to add one more because I'm reading it now. It's called Play Bigger. And it's by uh, Al Ramadan, Dave Peterson, Christopher Lockheed, and Kevin Manny. And uh, it just, it just took, that book talks more about becoming, um, uh, what is it called? Is it a content king? Seems yeah. Like me forgetting already, yeah, it's all, it's all about giving, right? Giving content. Um, and of yeah, course, I, 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 I know that there's what, one, all, one podcast that you, you, you got to have people listen to, you know, who says, like I said, I'm a book nerd, but I'm an equally big podcast nerd. So what's one podcast that's great for folks here in our industry? Well, for Pure Play Home Services, I would go with Tommy Mello. Um, his, it, what is his, is, uh, it's, isn't it the Home Service Expert? Home podcast? Services Expert, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's phenomenal. Um, so I, I have a few in rotation now. I have his, I have, I, so I listen to Colin Confidential every time it comes out, which is my podcast, because I'm not involved in um, all of the mixing and whatnot. So I, I like to hear it, but one that is, I mean, it's, it's definitely home services related, but it's called the boardroom buzz by the Potomac group, which is the number one M and a advisor in the pest control industry. They recently came out and it, it's more for owners. Um, even if you're not trying to buy or sell companies, um, they have a lot of people on that built 50 million, hundred million dollar companies and then sold them. And now that they sold them, they talk about everything that they did to be successful in their home service business. So, um, those are the three in rotation. Well, he's, guys, he's been very humble here. His, his own podcast colony confidential is, is awesome. There's, if you're not in the pest control business, it, it still works for you. So make sure you, Thank you. you give it a listen. 
Um, we've talked a lot about your life in the pest control industry. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about some of the things that maybe you would have done differently versus what you're doing today. But let's, let's assume you could hit the time machine button and go backwards. And it's day one, 18, just over 18 years ago when you started. And knowing what you know now about business, about life, about the industry, what's one single thing that you would do differently today than you did back in those early days? I would go into the residential market at the, at the exact same time I did commercial. That would be the one thing I would go back and tell myself, don't ignore the residential home services and do it ASAP. What's, what's in general, what's, what's so different about the two industries? Like in, in our industry, we're also very segmented. There's a commercial cleaning industry. There's a residential cleaning industry. Uh, and I know in your industry, there's also two different ones, but it, maybe there's a technical difference in our world. It's, it's, it's not necessarily as different when it comes to the technical side of what we do. Um, what's, what's, is that a general th trend in, for pest control companies to really just focus on one of two or do a lot of people try to attack both together? Um, I think now a lot of people try to attack both in the past. It's uh, people always try to have a good mixture because it's almost diversifying within the same exact business. Technically it's not that different. Um, mentality, it's huge, a uh, huge difference. Um, a commercial tech is fast paced, does still has to be friendly, but they're, they're also dealing with people that are fast paced and don't necessarily want to be bothered having a conversation with you. Whereas in home services, you have to account for tea time, maybe a cup of coffee, maybe a 15 minute conversation. You have to account for a lot of different things and it takes a different mentality from the service professional out there doing it. And I like with our residential, we said right away, we cannot take any commercial tech. We actually identified two that would be able to switch because they have the personality for it, but they need to go through a different kind of training and to learn how to deal with the residential clients. Because right now, everybody's just, you, you go to a commercial place, you get trained on it. Some places, you don't even really speak to too many people. Maybe there's someone at the front desk and an admin or something like that. And that's the huge difference is you have to, I mean, realistically, you have to have more of a personality to do the residential home service for pest control. So that's a huge difference. I agree. Very similar to our, our industry as well. It sounds like they're the same customers. So um, that was good advice. All right. Now you're in front of a thousand consumer service business owners. They're all listening to you. You've got the 18 year experience behind you. All these folks are just getting started. 1,000 people just earned their keys to the front door of their new home service business. You got, you got one thing you can tell them. What's the one piece of advice you'd share with everyone that they've got to listen to and they've got to act on? That's a tough question. <laughs> That's um, what we do here. I would say processes. Have your processes in place. Um, for everything. You don't even think, I mean, we have a process to put garbage out at our, at our office. We have a process on how to do processes. We have a format for processes. Um, but it's almost like we, we, nobody wants to hear about processes anymore, but anytime in the business, when someone asks me a question, how do I do this? I'm like, do you have a process for that? If we don't, I expect you to write one today because you know, and even starting out, I might have between going to residential, like the advice to myself, it would have been going to residential and processes. Because once you have those processes in place on exactly how to, let's just use uh, clean, home cleaning, how to wipe a surface, what chemical to use, how to mix this chemical, if you can do that. I mean, for us, every chemical is different and it depends on what you're going for. And we have that more on the treatment process. But once you can put all that on paper and then just review it on a regular basis um, and have red flags, is there a new SDS for this chemical? Uh, okay, there is. I got to go through it and make sure the process is correct and testing those processes. We have processes for hiring. We have processes for adding a service order. I processes. It has to be processes because once even you start out, you're the cleaner. As you're the cleaner, especially with today's 
technology, you don't have to type it out. You could be on a job with AirPods in and go into a note in your phone and talk out everything you're doing and save it. I'm clean, whatever it is, you could get as granular as you want. And I encourage that when you first start out because then it's easy to dial it back. It's hard to go f- to make it better after you're out of the service piece so much. But the process piece for us has just been amazing. Um, new high is thought and they're showing how to do stuff. And then if you're in the office, it's okay, you're going to do this all on your own today. You're going to follow the process to the T. And if you can't get through it with the process, you immediately have to call your manager and the manager has to go through the process with you and see what happened. Because obviously we have industry specific software. And when there's an update, there may be a new, a new thing that you have to check off or add when adding a service order. So, and then, so there's a process even for that. When you're doing a process and you run into a snag, now you go and you have your the custom service manager. They come down, they go through with you. So it just it's process after process after process. Right, to- but it's crazy. It helps. Totally agree. Love it because I think it's probably a very boring topic for a lot of people, but it's actually an extremely exciting topic for every. It should be an extremely exciting topic for every entrepreneur because. You can't make it without systems. You know that we, there's always a joke we make around here. There's a system to a system uh, on how to change the system at least, or how to even create a new system. But it's true. There's got to be a process on how you process things. So uh, yeah, you you need, you need all those things. And most people want to get so caught up in getting a new customer or hiring their first employee or creating a logo or whatever it might be. And those things are super fun. You know, they they are, they're, they're exciting for, especially for a new business owner sitting down and documenting what you do probably doesn't sound like the funnest thing in the world, but it's what's going to save your business. It's what's going to allow your business to grow. And that's really the only reason you started the thing in the first place. So I'm with you, man. I, I'm, I'm behind you here. Uh, process everything inside your business and it, it's going to work for you. It, it really is that simple. All right. So what a great talk, Joseph. You've been uh, amazing here today. So many nuggets that and pearls of wisdom that you shared with our audience. And I know that a lot of people are going to be taking notes and using it inside their, their home service business as we speak. And, you know, here at Two Maids and a Mop, we, we, we believe that, um, you know, we've done a lot over the last 18 years to, you know, build a brand from the ground up into where we are today. But it's clear that there's other folks in the home service industry that are also pretty strong as well. And, your life's a proof of that and a testament to that. So congratulations on 18 years of nothing but growth on top of growth. Uh, Thank you for your time today. I'd love for anyone that is listening to this show to also have an opportunity to interact with you and listen to some of your other podcasts that you do with, with other people as well. So feel free to share how to contact you and how to interact and get more from your content as well with the audience. Yeah, Ron, thanks again. It was great. Uh, Hour flew by. Um, so, yeah, obviously, I have Colony Pest Management uh, service in the New York Tri-State area. We have Synergy Sense, which is our canine scent detection team. That is from New York all the way down to Virginia, soon to be national. But our podcast is Colony Confidential Podcast. It's on all streaming sites, Apple, uh, Spotify. It's on everything. It's funny. I found it in my car on some streaming site I didn't even know we had. Um And if you want to reach out, you can reach out to the podcast at colonyconfidential at gmail.com. You can go to colonyconfidential.com to to see about our bios and everything. And my email is jsheehan at colonypestnyc.com. If you have questions, um, if you follow up on any of this, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions to the best of my ability. All right, Joseph, thanks again for your time today. We'll definitely interact down the road to talk more about franchising as you keep growing. So uh, thanks for everything and let's stay connected. Ron, thank you again, man. Have a good week. You too. You do the same. Thanks. Hey guys, Beth Lovett in business development. If you enjoyed this episode, then please share with your friends and don't forget to tune in to the next episode of Cleaning Up. Have you ever wondered if you wanted to be in business for yourself? If so, then don't hesitate to give me a call at 205-789-8027 or email me at bethl at ineedamaid.com. And if you just want to window shop, then you can see us online at twomaidsfranchise.com. <laughs>